there's the notification. Um, so the meeting will be recorded. Uh, we've taken steps to um, make sure that um, we're uh, keeping this to be a safe space um, with people who agree with us um, and are with us on the issues. Um, that said, there is always a chance that online trolls might join for a virtual event. Um, in the event that that happens, you, I will put up this image on the screen until we've properly removed that person from the chat. So we'll just pause the program. I'll put this up. And the minute that we're able to um, remove that person from the meeting, then we'll jump back into the discussion. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce our moderator for today's session, um, who is Hannah Evans, who is our communications manager at Population Connection. All right, ready to go? Yeah. All right, let me it. just share my screen here. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I am really looking forward to this panel and um, am happy to be moderating. This is the third day um, of Capitol Hill Days, and I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion plan for you guys today. Um, just to give you a quick uh, kind of idea of the structure of this panel, um, after this slide, I'm going to just briefly introduce each of the panelists. Um, they're going to go into a more sort of extensive ex explanation of their background and the work they do um, later, but I'm just going to kind of uh, briefly introduce them. Um, then I'm going to take about five to seven minutes to talk about um, our work um, as an organization, Population Connection, within the context of uh, population and climate change, and um, just kind of take some sort of introductory time to uh, talk through some of the major connections between population and climate change, um, and then to situate reproductive health and access to um, health and education within the context of climate solutions, and in particular, climate resiliency. From there, we're gonna have each panelist uh, take about five to seven minutes as well to kind of uh, introduce themselves and their personal backgrounds, um, as well as the work that they're doing um, within their respective organizations. Uh, we have representatives from Uganda, uh, Guatemala, Washington DC, and Venezuela. Um, so we've got a, a sort of global uh, uh, participation here, and um, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking through the ways in which population intersects with reproductive health and uh, climate change. Um, after everybody kind of goes through and the panelists discuss their own work, we're going to open it up for discussion. So as Lindsay said, um, if you have any questions that you'd like discussed um, during the panel, please uh, voice them in the chat and we will try to get to them as soon as possible. All right, let's get started. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce each of the panelists. Um, the first is Janet Larson. She has been working with us on and off for a few years and has been a great asset to us. We're happy to have her here on the panel. Um, Janet Larson is the founder of One Planet Strategies LLC in Washington, DC. Um, she's an environmental an analyst working to connect the dots among environmental and social issues, including that of climate, energy, water, food, and security. As the founder of One Planet Strategies, LLC, Janet does interdisciplinary research, writing, and analysis as an independent consultant. Previously, Janet worked at World Watch Institute and was one of the incorporators of the Earth Policy Institute, where she led the research team for 15 years. With Lester Brown and colleagues, she co-authored the books, The Great Transition, Shifting from Fossil Fuels to Solar and Wind Energy, and the Earth Policy Reader. Janet earned a bachelor's degree in Earth Systems from Stanford University and a master's in environmental management from Duke University. Next up, we have Dr. Rodrigo Barrias, who is also a uh, valued board member at Population Connection and Population Connection Action Fund. Um, he's also the executive director of Wings Guatemala. Um, he served on uh, Wings's board from 2011 to 2014, becoming president of its then Guatemalan subsidiary, Alas, in 2014. He brings over 18 years of experience working in both the private and public health sectors in Guatemala and the United States. Um, Rodrigo holds an MD degree from Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala and an MBA degree from the Universidad de Com Complutense de Madrid. 
Before joining WINGS, Rodrigo held the position of health manager for USAID's project Alianzas and worked closely with WINGS to execute multiple projects. Rodrigo is proud to be raising two feminist sons with his wife. It was kind of a bridging everybody's uh, um, bios, but I really wanted to include that last sentence because it's my very favorite. <laughs> Next up, we have Dr. Gladys Kalima Zikusoka. She is the founder and CEO of an organization that does some really, really amazing work in Uganda called Conservation Through Public Health. Um, it was founded in 2003 and, is, and they set up one of the very first One Health field programs in the world to protect endangered gorillas and other, and other wildlife. After graduating from the Royal Veterinary College at the University of London in 1996, she established the Uganda Wildlife Authority's first veterinary department. In 2003, she completed a zoological medicine residency and master in specialized veterinary medicine at, universe, or at North Carolina Zoological Park, excuse me, and North Carolina State University. In 2015, she founded Gorilla Conservation Coffee to support farmers living in uh, habitats surrounding where gorillas are found. And last but not least, we have Stephen Bloomstein. Uh, I think he's calling in from Venezuela or, or perhaps Florida. Um, in either case, he is the president of a great organization uh, that does um, some really impactful work in Venezuela called Turi Makire Foundation. Um, and Stephen grew up in the Boston area and graduated from the University of California at Berkeley before moving to Venezuela in 1973 to homestead in a natural setting and raise tropical fruits. After more than 20 years of remote rural living and farming, he started the Turi Makiri Foundation as a direct on the ground response to the human and environmental needs of, its, of his own and other rural communities throughout the state of Sucre. So again, really stacked lineup for everybody today. Really excited to have everybody here. Um, and again, just quickly before we kind of get into uh, the more uh, focused view of things, I wanted to give a brief kind of introduction into population health in the environment, as well as um, um, uh, population connections sort of focus on environmental issues as they relate to population dynamics and access to healthcare. Um, obviously, uh, this, this conference is very much focused on the sort of policy um, and advocacy side of things, um, but there's other, the, the other parts of our organization are very focused on sort of uh, education and outreach surrounding these broad sort of conceptual issues and their intersections. Um, so as an organization, Population Connection, again, focuses on the links between global po population dynamics and population growth access to comprehensive uh, healthcare and environmental sustainability. So we often use a really macro and sort of global scale to analyze and educate a, a, about the different ways that population growth impacts the planet. Um, and a lot of our work outside the policy and advocacy sphere is centered on education and outreach surrounding the various ways in which people interact with their environments um, and contribute to and are, and are affected by global environmental issues like that of climate change. Um, and we look at innovations in family planning as being central, of course, to addressing um, and meeting human rights standards globally, um, but also as a, a, an, an important uh, integrated developmental solution that simultaneously addresses social, economic, and environmental issues within societies. We also utilize, as well as everybody else um, on this panel today, what's called a PHE, or a Population Health and Environment Approach to Developmental Solutions. Um, and each panelist is gonna go into much more depth uh, of, regarding this concept, but um, essentially from an educational standpoint, what that means for us is that we strive to educate about the very interconnected nature of uh, environmental, environmental sustainability, as well as uh, public health. So often theoretically, you know, whenever we look at underlying issues surrounding human induced environmental problems like that of habitat destruction or species extinction or deforestation, um, it's very much an oversimplification to kind of look at those issues in isolation, right? Um, rather, uh, they can be largely traced back usually to issues of poverty, of marginalization, um, of lack of access to resources or economic alternatives or so on. 
And so as a theory goes, by increasing access to public health, to family planning education, to economic opportunity, to environmental conservation, um, education, and so on, we can simultaneously promote community-based environmental sustainability and conservation um, while also increasing levels of overall health for humans, um, animals, and the environment, thus kind of facilitating sustainable development through integrated approaches. Um, and this theory is based off of the kind of realization that we're, um, you know, forced more and more to kind of contend with, which is that the health of humanity is very much dependent on the health of the planet. And so ultimately using a global perspective, um, it makes it very clear that there are many complex and interconnected challenges facing the world today, um, which are largely of our own creation. Um, within the context of climate change, there are many different contributing factors that um, we're going to have to contend with as a global society, um, especially in the wake of these very real and imminent threats, threats uh, we're facing today. And while, of course, it's not in any way the sole contributor, um, population growth and demographic trends do play a really important role in understanding and confronting the climate crisis. Um, so too does health and well-being, um, the status of women, reproductive autonomy and rights, social justice, um, our economic structure, our globalized world, world economy, as well as histories of you know, colonization, imperialism, consumption and production practices, and so on. And so one important link um, that I think is going to help kind of uh, introduce this panel today is that um, between population, or excuse me, one important link between population and climate change is that of climate vulnerability and climate justice. Um, so the fact that many of the world's most at-risk populations are growing the fastest means that more people are, are at risk of experiencing the effects of climate change who lack the ability or capital to readily respond and recover. And these populations, ironically, um, are also the least culpable for CO2 emissions, which cause climate change, um, which causes, uh, which presents, you know, many different climate justice issues that compound along social and economic inequities. And just to give a quick sort of broad example, um, UN research shows that uh, the world's 47 least developed countries are also the fastest growing. Many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, such as the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, and South Sudan, are experiencing some of the world's fastest population growth rates while being among the most vulnerable to climate change. As you can see here by looking at this chart, nine out of the 10 most climate vulnerable countries are actually in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is projected to double in population by 2050. And this is presenting, this is going to present real problems with regards to food security, conflict, migration, uh, climate impacts, you know, arable lands, uh, and so on. So high fertility and, and rapid population growth in regions that are already vulnerable socially and environmentally um, should be really included as an issue of climate justice. The fact that there's a clear correlation between high fertility rates and poverty and the fact that high fertility rates result very linearly from an unmet need for contraceptives and the inability of women to access the resources necessary in order to control their own fertility um, is a human rights violation. Again, rapid population growth in, in low income regions really prevents sustainable development and further institutionalizes poverty while increasing strain on, in, in localized settings on um, both natural resources and social systems. So really making the links here between population dynamics and a variety of social and other and environmental issues. Um, and sort of, you know, bringing it all together within the context of reproductive health, it's important to understand that these, that there are, there's a confluence of issues happening um, that are, that is exacerbating risks uh, in particular regions of the world. Um, so worldwide, the same regions that experience high fertility, low economic status and high climate vulnerability also have a very high unmet need for contraceptives and reproductive health care services. Um, an unmet need for family planning in these regions actually really increases climate vulnerability and inhibits the ability of individuals, um, households, and communities to adapt to a progressively warmer uh, climate. 
And in, in recognition of all of these like interconnected uh, issues that magnify new and existing inequalities, there really should be greater attention paid to the um, effectiveness of meeting the unmet need for family planning services and helping to create resilience um, in terms of climate adaptation and to increase an adaptive capacity, uh, both in general and especially for uh, the world regions that are most at risk. Um, recent research has actually come out substantiating the fact that uh, meeting women's needs for family planning and reproductive health actually benefits climate adaptation by increasing resilience. Um, and this is because, uh, you know, whenever women and children are healthier, um, they gain social, economic, and uh, political power, thus increasing their possibilities for engaging in climate adaptation. Um, ultimately, whenever rates of unintended pregnancies are reduced, that results in smaller families and, and a reduced demand for climate sensitive resources like food and water. Um, and ultimately, over time, slower population growth through voluntary measures and meeting uh, the unmet need for family planning services lessens pressure on local um, natural resources and exposes fewer people to climate impacts. So meeting both human rights and environmental um, initiatives worldwide. Okay, so with that conceptual overview, I'm going to turn it over to Janet, who's going to talk about the um, present state of climate change with regards to uh, the availability of natural resources and so on. I'll let Janet talk. Janet, you're muted right now. There you go. Thanks so much, Hannah. And thanks for everyone for being here today. Um, it's really a pleasure to join you to talk about these issues at a time when the entire world, whether they realize it or not, is in the middle of a giant experiment where we find out the intense linkages among population health and the environment as we are uh, suffering through and trying to deal with um, a pandemic disease that jumped from nature back to humans, something that scientists of course are telling us we'll see more and more of in the future as population continues to expand into our wilder areas um, and forests and other wildlands get smaller and uh, we have more and more interaction with nature while meanwhile we're trying to feed um, a planet of close to 8 billion uh, that is looking to eat more meat, milk and eggs and putting all these animals together also creates this, this soup of diseases um, that we could be encountering. But I'll take a step um, back just to give a very brief look at what climate change is looking like now. Um, we are in an unprecedented time. And Hannah, if you could switch to the yes, first sir. slide. Um, since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, uh, humans have been burning coal and oil and more recently natural gas. And that is putting more and more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, what that does is um, creates the greenhouse effect these heat trapping gases are at unprecedented levels of over 800,000 years, um, which is pretty remarkable when you think of humans short time uh, in agriculturally based civilizations is only about 12,000 years. So we're moving well outside the realm of carbon dioxide we know. We can see um, in the next slide how this is um, playing out in terms of global temperature just since 1850 with moved well beyond the average temperatures. Um, and we're now close to a degree Celsius higher than we were at the start of the industrial era. So what this means, um, we can just slide through the, the next series of, of photos. We have melting ice, uh, melting sea ice in the Arctic, melting ice on our ice caps, Greenland, Antarctica, in the mountain our mountain glaciers, which we call our reservoirs in the sky. These are the areas that supply water during the dry season to much of the world. Importantly, um, most of Asia's major rivers originate from glaciers in the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. Um, these are all experiencing increased melting, which means in the short term, more water. But in the long term, you can start to see some rivers start to go dry. We're having soil erosion. Um, and there's a report from the US Embassy in, that, in China called Desert Mergers and Acquisitions. It's not mergers and acquisitions of companies, but deserts actually moving closer, overtaking each other. We can keep 
uh, flipping through the slides. Um, and so this is what happens as deserts merge and spread. Um, and this is from the trifecta of overplowing, overgrazing, and overpumping. Um, and so what overpumping looks like, we can see here, this is in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia figured out how to use those that oil well drilling technology um, to get de deep down into fossil aquifers under the desert and for many years was growing wheat. They just they realized though that it is a fossil aquifer. That means the water is not replenished with rainfall. Um, and so like an oil well, once you over pump that, eventually the water will drill, will run out and there's over pumping happening at various scales in at least 18 countries in the world. That's probably an underestimate, but home to about 4 billion people. Um, so in the short term, just like those river glaciers, over pumping gets you more water and higher food production. But in the long run, you have to figure out new ways to get water once underground aquifers are, are depleted or over pumped past faster than they can be replenished naturally. So we can keep, next slide. So the water requirements of food are enormous. Uh, just the back of the envelope calculation, it takes about a thousand pounds of water to produce um, one pound of grain. So then you scale that up to uh, meat, milk, eggs, and the water requirements of the typical American diet are humongous. This is what most Americans would consider a pretty paltry a serving of beef and yet it requires 86 gallons of water to produce. So all these trends are, are coming together as population of course is, is, is continuing to grow and people are becoming richer. They want to um, eat like, like as, as they want, as they can, as, they, as people can afford it. Typically they move up the food chain. Um, there is some good news, uh, America and a number of other European, Australia countries that we have hit peak meat and meat consumption is actually starting to go down. But anytime you're looking at population and food production, you have to figure out you know, how many people can we feed? It really depends at what level of consumption. Uh, if we all ate like people in India, we could feed probably eight to 10 billion people. If we all ate like Americans, we could feed about 6 billion people at current food production. And so clearly we've overshot if we're trying to eat like Americans. Uh, so, so what does this mean? Um, I'm going to highlight the work of the organization Project Drawdown, which looked at a, the variety of solutions for uh, mitigating climate change to figuring out how do we cut our emissions and not only cut our greenhouse gas emissions, but start to absorb more carbon from the atmosphere, from uh, planting new forests and helping uh, natural systems regenerate. And um, many of the technological solutions people point to, wind and solar, um, those are there, those exist, those are important. But you see in the bottom part of the pie, the pink part that's educating girls and family planning is a majorly important part of the picture. Um, and that's because scientists have modeled things like if, if the world continues at a high population growth rate, carbon emissions by the end of the century will be 41% higher than if we move toward closer to a lower level of population growth. Um, and the good news is, is that investing in, in um, things like educating girls and family planning are, are some of the cheapest climate change solutions we have and their benefits magnify across the generations. So for example, uh, to cut a ton of carbon dioxide emissions uh, by investing in family planning that costs about $4.50 per ton of carbon. For girls education, it costs about $10 per ton of carbon averted. Um, which is much cheaper than even, even the low cost wind and solar, which come in closer to 20 to 20 to $30 per ton of carbon. So family planning um, not only is a great way to um, achieve human rights, achieve community resiliency, um, but it also is an important climate solution. So um, I am looking forward to hearing more of the, the on the ground, that's sort of the 35,000 foot view. Um, and this is just a book I worked on with my colleagues. If anyone wants to learn more about the energy side of the transition, um, 
and happy to take questions later. Thanks so much. All right, thank you, Janet. Now what we are going to hear from Rodrigo. Rodrigo, take it away. Thanks, Anna. Um, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. I mean, it's an honor. Um, what a panel I have the privilege of being a part of, and, and it's just amazing. Um, and congratulations to you all for putting, you know, Digital Capital Hills. It's amazing that, that you do that. Um, so Wix is a rights-based patient-centered sexual reproductive health and rights local nonprofit only working in Guatemala. We are celebrating this year our 20th anniversary. Um, and since the very beginning, we've only been doing this, sexual reproductive health and rights. Uh, we believe that it all begins with rep reproductive rights. Um, it's to us, it's, it's the, the beginning of absolutely everything, right? Uh, unfortunately, in a country like Guatemala, there's still so many barriers like lack of access to care, lack of education, um, you know, political instability, lack of government services, um, norms that discourage uh, contraceptive use. And that's a big issue um, in a country that's, that's uh, historically been very conservative. Uh, both the Mayan culture and the religious um, influence, both Catholic and evangelical, uh, makes us a very conservative country. And so these barriers continue to be, even, you know, for us after 20 years, continue to be um, huge issues that we need to deal with here on every single every single day. Um, the fact that we all know this, everyone here today, all the participants know that the problem that we're seeing is unmet need. Um, and, and how is that, you know, uh, turning out to be a, an increased number in unplanned pregnancies? and how if we were able to increase the access to services and education, we would be able to decrease malnutrition. Guatemala is, is the only country in the Western hemisphere where chronic malnutrition for children under five is close to 50%. Um, if we increase services and education, we would be decreasing maternal and infant deaths, which is a huge problem in Guatemala still. We would increase job opportunities and that turns into, you know, decreased forced migration, for example, that uh, an issue that, you know, all those of you in the US are dealing with right now on the border, right? Um, it was so interesting to use a very polite word to see yesterday, the decision by Mexico to close its uh, border with Guatemala. Um, as a result, basically, of getting you know, 2.5 million doses of the COVID vaccine from the US, right? It's a quid pro quo. It's not about COVID. It's about how do we limit that? But how do we deal with the fact that because of the huge environmental impact that Guatemala is seeing, there's also forced migration. Um, Guatemala, there was, a, there was a, a report a few years ago, maybe five or 10 years ago from the National Geographic Society that said, the Guatemala is in the top 10 um, countries for most at risk for climate change. Uh, probably not, not in the top 10 anymore, but you know we see it every single year with the hurricanes and the droughts and how is that forcing migration towards, towards the, the US, you know, looking or, you know, for the American dream. And so we're trying to deal with that here locally um, through an approach that has both education um, in sexual reproductive health, especially for youth. Uh, youth uh, teen pregnancy. We're going to ask one of the few countries in the world where it's actually been rising for the last few years. So we're dealing with that. Um, the idea, there was a question uh, on the chat box. What's the relationship between um, girls' education and um, I, I think it was, it, was, it was either fertility or you know, uh, prevention of unplanned pregnancies. It's, you know, it's a, there's a, real, a direct correlation, right? Um, but we're working in a country where there is no real public health system. It's broken. It was broken before COVID. COVID just came and, and exacerbated the whole thing. And we're seeing that in so many different countries in, in the region, in, in Central America, um, in, in some countries in, in South America as well, is how is a system that was never made and was never created to serve those at risk, those, those vulnerable populations is now even more broken. 
Um, so it's it's really it's really difficult to work in an environment like that. But yet, you know, here we are after 20 years. Um, and the way we close the circle is that we're providing services. Um, the unmet need for, for contraceptive, um, contraceptive methods is still huge, right? And there was, there was also a question saying, you know, what's, what's the best method, contraceptive method? Um, and it's really the one that the woman chooses, you know? It's not the one that we uh, service providers will, you know, will, will say or any government will say. It's what the women chooses, what the patient will use. Um, and so we're trying to access, to provide more access to that um, via a rice-based patient-centered approach. Um, but even though we have, as, as a country, we have made progress, we are still a long way from, from getting to where we need to get. You know, the fertility rate in Guatemala, and this is tyranny of the averages, by the way, is, is 3.1. But in Guatemala City, that's 1.8. In some of the communities where we work up north in the northern departments that were heavily hit by, by the hurricanes last year, um, it's 4.2, 4.6, depending on the community. So a fertility rate that's still, you know, on average 3.1, it's still very high for those resources that we're trying to um, take care of in our environment. Again, you know, forced migration, lack of economic opportunities, lack of jobs, um, a system that is not made up to take on hundreds of thousands of new children into the schools every year. And, and so it's, you know, it's a vicious circle. It's a vicious circle. And that's what we're trying to do. And we know that you know, our, our work is not enough. I don't think any nonprofit will ever have enough capacity to deal with this issue. So how can we, you know, together, those of us who are working on this specific issue with the country, with the national health system that, you know, hopefully will continue to make improvements, um, will be able to look at the, at the full picture. It's not just about family planning. It's not just about accessing, you know, contraceptive methods in a place where there's no need because, I'm sorry, there's no, there's no um, availability because that community may be three hours by foot, you know, away. Uh, from the nearest health center is how do we deal with the full picture in a holistic in a holistic way um, and I will repeat you know the fact that the government seems to not pay so much attention to it is is something that's going to perpetuate this issue for a very long time but I, I don't think that you know our country and and you know our resources can take much of it we're getting into a point where every single year, um, the environment, the, the climate change is just, it, it's, it's confirming what we've been, you know, talking about for the last 10 years. Um, and, and yet again, how do we do it in a responsible, um, rights-based and patient center approach? So it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of issues that we are dealing as a local nonprofit. We're a small nonprofit, you know, our budget is $1.5 million. Um, we reach about 25,000 individuals every year. We prevent, you know, 30 to 50,000 uh, pregnancies, un un unwanted pregnancies every year, but that's definitely not enough. And, and don't even, you know, let's not even get started with, uh, with the topic of abortion in Guatemala. Um, uh, we're, we're nowhere near, you know, we just saw, we just saw the repercussions uh, from uh, abortion being approved in, in Argentina, which I celebrated. And, and we saw that immediate reaction from, from, you know, again, a conservative society. Um, Honduras, you know, basically, you know, shut it, the whole thing down because of, because of that. Um, and, and Guatemala is, is seeing some of that too. So it's, it's a lot of moving parts. Um, as you said, Janet, those of us who are on the ground see it much more differently. And it's not, it, it's not a simple approach. It's not a one way. It, it's many different moving parts. And I think that's the complexity. Um, certainly in a, in a country like Guatemala. Um, but I'm optimistic things are moving and, and hopefully we'll see more and more of the younger generations, I'm hopeful the, the, to them, that they will see you know, a, a, a new future of opportunities if we deal with these issues. So you know, that's kind of the, <laughs> the, the picture from Guatemala. Thank you, Rodrigo. I'm really looking forward to uh, teasing out more of the, the kind of impact that Argentina has had. I've been interested Oof. to learn. 
about that. Um, all right, let's turn it over to Dr. Gladys from Conservation Through Public Health. Quick five. Minutes. Hello, Ed. Yes, hello, everybody. I'm speaking from my phone because my laptop's a bit unstable. Um, yeah, I'm calling from Uganda. Thanks so much for inviting me on the panel today. We got into family planning in a completely different way. Um, I started off as a first pet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And one of the first diseases I had to handle um, came from people living around the park who have very little health care. The gorillas got scabies when they went to people's gardens to eat their banana plants and they found dirty clothing on the scarecrows. And although I was hired actually because they were concerned that tourists were gonna make gorillas sick with something like COVID-19, the very first disease came from the local community. And when I first arrived Bwindi, I found that there was a very hard edge between the community and the park. Because once it became a national park, people were not allowed to go in and cut trees, but the gorillas as they got used to people went back to their former ranges. That population growth, the population density is between 200 to 300 people per square kilometer. So it's very, very high. And um, let's try and get this. So it didn't take long for for us to realize that people had very large focus was preventing infectious disease by improving community health. We found that people are having 10 children per family, um, 10 children per woman, actually. And this is just the light births. And they're just having babies every year. They didn't know what to do about it. And at first I thought, well, what does this have to do with conservation? But you found that when people have very large families, they can't give them proper health care. They have to go into the forest to poach more. They need more firewood to feed 10 mouths instead of maybe four. And so we got convinced to get into family planning. And what happened is that we are used it using a couple peer education approach because majority of the girls around us were pregnant by the age of 13. It's really shocking, but you, you never had a, a single youth. They were always pregnant. So we thought let's use a couple peer approach. And uh, we started working with them, talking to them about the benefits and methods of family planning. And when we started out, there were only about 20% of the women were family planning, and now it's 67%, higher than the national average, which increased from 30 to 45. Women are liberated. They'll tell you, I don't have to have a baby every year. I can do something else with my life. And there's a, the best testimony is a lady who had three daughters, and she was stopped looking for a son because of our program. And she owns a shop. And you know that her three daughters are going to have the best life ever. One thing I can say is one of the very first people we hired at Conservation Through Public Health was the first female graduate in the whole area. Her father was actually a traditional healer. And he had the foresight to educate his daughter, Basta, unlike other men in the area. And she went and did a bachelor in tourism at Makere University because guerrilla tourism had begun. So when she came to me asking for a job, she was 25 years old. She didn't have any children. And now at the age of, um, you know, 10 years later, she has four children, which is pretty good for her community because by the age of 25, most people have had five children. By the age of 36, 10, they look very old and yet they're actually young people. So we found that family planning has made a huge difference. People are, the women are very liberated and it means that less people are going into the forest to poach and collect firewood. There has been, COVID has brought a lot of, changed the dynamics a little bit where people have become very um, poor and desperate because of lack of tourism revenue. And they've ended up having to go into the forest to poach. And that's when we got into provision of food security where we are providing fast growing seedlings for the most vulnerable people. And I saw when I saw it on Hannah's slide, I realized food security has a lot to do with it. Um, but however, we are trying to get them to start growing food sustainably so that even when tourists come back, they can still continue eating this food. And so we're working closely with the schools as well. We are teaching the children about PHE in a sensitive way. And a lot of them are embracing it in the schools. We teach them, we have kids leagues where kids are taught to, to learn how to um, 
the topics we're teaching through sports. So they can't only pass the game, but they have to pass the squiz. Um, the men are really endorsing the women being on family planning. Even the marginalized Batwa Pygmy tribe, they'll tell you that I'm, I'm having little ch few children because I want the children I can care about and look after. And these are the poorest of the poor. So people are really linking family planning, balancing the family budget and having a better quality of life. It's really liberated the women and it's liberated the girl child. And we feel that in that particular part of Uganda, I've been asked by the Ministry of Health to give talks about family planning from non-traditional sectors. The day that the president of Uganda declared that family planning is fine after 30 years in power, it was pretty amazing. But I was there on that day and I was asked to speak in a plenary session and the head of UN um, FPA was just so excited. And uh, people realized that if you start to engage in non-traditional sectors, the conservation community, the religious communities, you can really make a lot of headway with family planning, balancing the family budget and reducing poverty in a country that has a very high human population growth rate. So we're really grateful to Population Connection for supporting our efforts. And we'd love to host Rebecca, Hannah, Stacy, and we hope to host John one day and all of you to come over to Uganda and see the amazing, magnificent, endangered mountain gorillas who I'm pleased to say that the numbers are growing um, as the people's population growth is reducing, the numbers of gorillas are growing. And now our biggest problem is how do we have enough land for them to grow? But since we're addressing the family planning issue, people are having less land wrangles because they have less children to fight over land. We feel that it would be easier to convince people to expand so that the, good num the space for the gorillas can grow and the country continue to develop sustainably. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gladys. Uh, it's always really, really amazing learning about your organization. It's uh, such a quintessential and perfect uh, um, explanation of PAG approaches to development and um, their work has just been so impactful. I love the, the explanation of being able to um, you know, facilitate conservation through increasing livelihoods and economic alternatives for people. Um, it really kind of shines light on the, the connections between social justice, climate justice, environmental justice, and so forth. So thank you. Okay, uh, last but not least, again, we've got Stephen here from Turdy Makire. If you could just, we're kind of actually running out of time. If you um, can give just like a five, five minute overview of your organization. I'm, we're really looking forward to hearing about it. And then we're gonna get into a couple discussion questions before the end. Thanks, Steve, you're, you were on mute. There you go. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, hi. Well, I can be somewhat briefer because both Rodrigo and Gladys have pretty much covered all the main points here and they've done it pretty well. Um, so I, we, our Turi Mikiri Foundation started in the late 1990s, very much in response to the uh, communities where I and our small group had been living for at least 20 years previous to that. We started, um, we got into this from the ground up. We, uh, a small group of us began to do rural, remote rural farming. And I'm talking like three or four hours off from the nearest road, just hiking in where we lived with the campesinos. Campesinos are, you know, rural people in our area, mostly illiterate, uh, really struggling hand to mouth to live. And we started farming, fruit farming in the area. And we were, um, these are mountains in Northeastern Venezuela, uh, for the large part, heavily deforested from 400 years of slash and burn farming and increasing population pressure. Um, women, as Gladys said, women 30 years old will have eight to 10 children. Those, and these may only be the ones that are living. And um, with usually several deaths and other complications along the way. I actually uh, wrote an article about this for the Population Connection several years ago, which I think I was called the reproductive treadmill. Because these women starting, as again Gladys said, at 13 or 14 years old, start 
uh, having babies one after another with no access to family planning or any way to deal with it. I, I remember when we started and I asked the woman, uh, when we started doing family planning and I asked the woman, uh, when was your last period? She looked at me and said, seven years ago, because she had been sequentially pregnant one after another for all the fast years. And in fact, it turned out she had only had two or three periods in her whole life. She was about 24 years old at that point. So those were the kind of wake up calls that, that um, came with our experience of actually living on the ground and you know, in the situation. So we started our foundation in the late nineties and our working model is what we call a recipe for a thriving community. The, and, and we were speaking very directly to our community, but very quickly it, it expanded to include other communities as well. The first, the first piece in this recipe is family planning, offering women family planning. There is an, un, as Rodrigo pointed out, there's an absolutely unlimited demand for this. You cannot, you, I don't see how uh, any nonprofit or even with the government can satisfy it. It is accumulated to such a degree in Venezuela. This is just as true uh, as I'm sure it is in Guatemala, in Africa. It's just, it's, it's astonishing. And um, the women know what they want. And while the men may be a little more conservative, they come around really quickly. They come around really quickly when they see the benefits for their families, for their children. You know, we have what's called machismo and a little reticent about it, but, but they come around very quickly. What we learned is after you, um, after you reach women and help them control their fertility, almost directly found within a year or two of a mother controlling her fertility, she focuses on wanting to educate her children. And they can, and so in our community, they came to us. This, you know, we, will, we live in very close contact with our community. Once we had extended family planning enough, the women came to us generally, um, and they wanted to get, you know, better educate their children. So our little foundation started an education program as well. Uh, and then what we learned is that the young girls and young women were much more open to availing themselves of these educational opportunities. And then what we learned is as these young women, um, you know, improved their education, got through high school, some of them got into college, we, we were supporting them through this process. Uh, they immediately, if they became sexually active, they immediately wanted family planning, which fortunately we were able to provide in order to, to further their own life projects, their own plans for their lives. So it became kind of, uh, kind of seamless in a way. And we also learned that mothers and grandmothers were the very first to support their daughters in family planning. In fact, they were often bringing them in. It, it, it's, like, it's kind of like a gestalt. Once you get in the flow of this, it just goes. So if you have the resources, the funding, you can, it's just very easy to, to grow and grow it. We then, then the third part of our recipe was sort of community action, mobilizing people whose resources have now been uh, liberated somewhat so they can now think about something else than the next child and taking care of the next baby and, and feeding all their children and start to work on community projects and which is a lot of fun. And, and then finally, because Venezuela entered, has entered in the last 10 years into really a, a pretty severe humanitarian crisis, we've had to uh, dedicate some of our resources to just plain humanitarian aid. And as Gladys says, very simple things like food security. And these things really count when, when people are, are in that much trouble. So... We, one thing around the PHE, the Population Health Environment Initiative that we learned, we had a brief golden period where our family planning program had basically saturated our small value, Valley. Now, since then, we have expanded into any number of counties throughout the state of Sucre and even into other states in Venezuela because the demand is insatiable and the word of mouth travels and people come to us. People come to us from all parts of the country because they have no access to these resources where they are. 
But in our little valley, we did manage to saturate. There are almost no more unintended children. The level of education has improved a small notch, but significantly young women are not getting pregnant at 13 or 14. They're getting pregnant when they want to, and that's often 21, 22, uh, you know, sometimes 19, but, but there's just a whole age shift and a whole, uh, women, women's desires uh, um, are now aligning with their possibilities, with, with what, they can, what they can do. And we also noticed that the amount of deforestation in our upper valley began to cut way down as there were less mouths to feed. The men had to slash and burn the forests less in order to, to feed their families and generate enough extra money for, for clothing and whatnot. And all this started to come down so that our upper valley forests started to reforest, then wildlife came back, the stream started to run clean. It was kind of idyllic. It was really kind of lovely. I felt like it was in a real example of PHE in action. But then the humanitarian crisis hit, people had no other sources of food. We began to have urban migrants coming into the valley looking for ways to survive. And now they're starting to slash and burn again. But I thought, and we have starting to lose some of the forestation that we had gained, but I felt that it was a very clear example of what family planning can do for an environment. And since reforestation is one of the keys for climate change the world over, you know, we each start where we are. And so locally we were making a small contribution there. Um, and it basically came from, from starting with family planning. Um, so I think that's, I don't wanna run longer than my time. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you explaining all of your uh, impactful work. Um, I know that it's been a, a really, really difficult, especially recently, uh, the situation in Venezuela is not easy. So um, thank you for the work you're doing. Um, unfortunately, we've kind of uh, run out of time instantly, seemingly, uh, but I, I want to just make sure that we address a couple of different questions before we end, um, and perhaps we can go over if people don't have uh, obligations. Um, I'm noticing in the chat that there's been a lot of discussion probably stemming from my, uh, from my introduction as well as Janet's. Um, like wondering about carrying capacity for the planet. So the amount of, uh, the total amount of people um, that the planet can sustain indefinitely um, while maintaining, you know, natural systems and biodiversity and things like that. Um, and coupled with that are kind of questions about uh, population growth versus consumption patterns um, within the context of climate change and um, the sort of overall culprits uh, you know, or, or sort of focal point from which we should be looking at climate solutions. Um, and just quickly to, before I kind of get into that, I just wanted to make clear that um, we're looking at, you know, the, the sort of intersections again between population, health and the environment, recognizing that, you know, a lot of different systems of oppression and inequities are, are connected, right? So by addressing social inequities um, and, and by providing economic alternatives, we can facilitate environmental protections um, and conservation overall. Um, but we also recognize that population pressures do uh, you know, pose a variety of social and environmental problems, um, as each panelist has pointed out. Um, and Janet's uh, sort of analysis that looks at uh, Drawdown, the, the, the research that's put forth by Drawdown, um, in which uh, emissions will be offset largely through in innovations in family planning and girls' education, um, is, is, is really, really good research, but it's importantly one important solution to an adaptation strategy for climate change. There are many others as well. Our work is at the sort of nexus between these, uh, these three broad sort of conceptual issues. Um, but I wanted to just open it up really quickly to um, any of the panelists, especially those uh, working on the ground in various places where fertility rates might be higher, um, and, that, and where you're actually seeing population pressures, um, you know, how, how are population pressures viewed within the context of climate change in Guatemala or Venezuela or Uganda? Um, and um, do you guys view it as something that is, uh, you know, a, a real imminent threat? Um, I can go ahead if you want. I mean, yes, absolutely. We, we do see it, but it's, it's something that's, 
has been talked about, you know, for long, for a long time, it was, it was, it was the issue with unmet need was, was, was different. Now we're seeing from a different, from different lenses, one of which is environment, right? Resources. And, <laughs> and at a local level, I mean, I, I can tell you about, you know, the, the family who has three versus 10 children, right? You know, the, the amount of, of crops that they're gonna, they're gonna be able to have per year is just gonna be different, right? Um, so I think we need to look at those, you know, small examples before we look at the whole picture, right? At, at, the, at, the, at the whole planet. And I know there's, and, and there are a lot of comments on, on you know, uh, the rich countries versus uh, the, the, the poor countries and eugenics versus another point of view. Um, and it, it's, we're not gonna get to it, you know, in an hour. Uh, I, I think just the start is to look at the very small examples of what's happening um, because of that, right? And, and, and how do we look at this issue from different perspectives? And how can we all come together to try to, you know, create a solution that's viable and that's patient um, rights-based? Right. Um, Gladys or Steve, do you want to do you want to chime in there? Or, well, um, you know, I think that, you know, that's exactly right. And, but I think that, you know, these are not competing solutions. E every single factor that we're talking about is a significant factor that has to be addressed, especially to address something global like climate change. Um, now, as someone who works in family planning, I would make the argument that that's a fabulous place to to, to really focus because as I think Janet pointed out, it's extremely economical, it, it's extremely doable, and it's a, what's it called, a, sell, a buyer's market, a seller's market when you don't have to sell it. It, it, it markets itself. There's an enormous demand for this. So it's also a way to offer people their human rights, you know, their, their potential to fully evolve, especially young women, girls and young women. So, you know, I think while all of us have to work on the parts that we personally care the most about or are the best at, uh, so my part is to lobby for that, for the family planning part. Right, and, and also, yeah. I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead, Gladys. Yeah, just to add on to what Steve said, if you're able to balance your family budget and you're able to have the children you can afford, then it makes it easier for you to you know, cope with climate change. And it's just all what, it all, all comes together. It's all about being able to manage yourself and having a better quality of life. And actually for women in developing countries, family planning is, is actually um, a, a basic human need, you know, human rights. So the more that you can liberate them and the more their husbands support them, then they plan together and they're better able to cope with climate change. Right, right, and that's the point I was going to bring up as well. Is is that of of climate resilience, right? This is very much about, of course, giving people access to their fundamental human right to choose when, whether, and with whom to have, to become pregnant. But it also yields a variety of other social, environmental, and economic benefits to society. And within the context of climate change, it really helps people to, um, you know, better prepare and adapt to these unpredictable, changing climates um, that are. Um, exacerbated in the places that are um, the, you know, the most low income, right? So um, it's really about these integrated approaches. Um, and, and stemming from that, Janet, I don't know if you want to um, maybe start off uh, answering this question, but there's been some discussion in the chat about um, how to, whenever we're talking about population dynamics as they relate to the environment, um, and whenever we're talking about emissions offsets, for example, through innovations in family planning, how can we, um, especially as representatives from uh, the United States, right? I'm an imperialist nation that is a very high producing, uh, high waste producing, high CO2 emission producing country. Um, how are we able to um, frame this issue in a way that uh, institutionalizes human rights rather than um, uh, assumes or infers population control measures or eugenics? I mean, I think the way that Population Connection and these other organizations tend to, to frame it is giving people what they want. 
giving giving them the education to make their own choices, giving them the resources, and then also acknowledge that there has been such huge inequities in terms of global planetary resource use. So the industrial countries got to cut down forests. We got, we got to dig our coal, we got to burn our oil. Um, and there's billions of people that have not reaped the benefits there. And so figuring out, um, and this is happening in, in the international climate negotiations as well, figure out how to make it more just. And a lot of that was resource monetary transfers um, to, to, to help, well, never even the playing field for you know people in Bangladesh who <laughs> are 2% of the population, but emit 0.2% of the total carbon, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna balance that out, but we can help um, these communities be able to, to mitigate climate change and then adapt um, and, and I think you hit the key word with resilience. It's all about resilience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, I, I'm really glad that this issue is being brought up because obviously as a, an organization that focuses on population, we do confront it very a lot. Um, and I think it's one of the major inhibitors to making this issue more mainstream. And I think it's really, really good to tease through. So I'm glad people are, are in the chat um, aware of these issues and wanting to confront them head on. Um, I think ultimately we have to recognize climate change as an existential threat, right, to humanity. And this is, uh, these threats are very imminent. They're happening, we're already seeing climate impacts now. So this is about kind of organizing and understanding the scope and severity of the issue and approaching it in a, comp in a comprehensive and nuanced way, right? As Rodrigo said, there's not just one solution to climate change. Um, and population growth is not the number one contributor by any means to climate change. So this is not about forcing people to, um, you know, live lives that, you know, that are different than, you know, what we're living. This is not about sort of draconian measures at all. This is about um, reproductive autonomy, which again is, is very fundamental for um, our own, you know, survival as a species in many different ways. Um, I think that perhaps we have question time for, for maybe one more. I know we're already running over time here, um, but I was going to ask just sort of uh, maybe Rodrigo and Steven, the, the influence recently that um, Argentina has had in terms of, uh, you know, uh, mobility and, and advocacy regarding, um, you know, reproductive health, family planning, as you mentioned, Rodrigo, uh, Guatemala and Central and South America in general as, as well are really fundamentalist religious countries. And so you see not only barriers in access, but also cultural um, to, uh, to family planning and, and uptake of rep reproductive health care services. So Obviously, in Honduras, we've seen a, a complete backlash as a, in response to um, liberalizing abortion measures. But um, what is the feeling politically, I guess, at this stage? Steve, you want to go ahead first? Um, well, I can be, uh, yeah, because I think you may have more to say about that. In Venezuela, in the part of Venezuela where, where we work, which is really a remote rural area, uh, abortion is really not that much of a, of a factor. Very, it's deeply Catholic and um, it's practiced, of course it's practiced, but it's, it's not really part of, of the, um, uh, it's not really part of an agenda that we have to deal with very much. It's very much in the background. Uh, and the Argentinian, um, decisions and their their progress was applauded by the by the educated uh, let's say class that we work with. Uh, but one thing I I I I feel like I might add to it is that except for abortion, when it comes to family planning, we have a lot of support from the local church, from the local Catholic church, the parish priests. And, and just the whole hierarchy of the church, as long as you don't go near abortion, is very pro-family planning, which is not something I understand, uh, you know, we see in the Vatican. So, so it's just worth mentioning that at least in our case where we work, uh, the church and other conservative factors of society have not been 
uh, obstacles for us. In fact, they, they to some degree have helped. Uh, but again, you don't go near abortion. On the contrary, in Guatemala, um, the Catholic Church and, and most of the evangelical churches, I mean, 95% of them are, are extremely against family planning and, and not even mention abortion. I mean, um, the, but there's, there's, a, there's a big difference. Um, Catholic, the Catholic Church tends to stay at a municipal level. It doesn't go all the way out to the rural communities. You see some evangelical churches out there and they're more open to family planning. Um, so we, you know, it, it's kind of a playing the system in a way, right? Um, I would say even before Argentina happened in late December, um, we can go back the last, you know, four years, and I'm not even going to mention the name, but that mindset of, of just against absolutely everything, right? Um, it created a space for governments in this region to, you know, feel empowered to really go against abortion and, you know, uh, reproductive rights. Um, there was a huge negative influence from the North, right? Um, and we saw that as a reaction in, in Honduras as a reaction to Argentina, just be, you know, this president that felt that he could, you know, basically react in Congress and, and outlaw abortion. Um, in, in Guatemala, abortion is only uh, approved if, if the woman's life is in, is in danger, is at risk. And two physicians need to sign off on that. So in, in, for practical purposes, abortion is absolutely you know, illegal. It, it's not accessible to anyone. Yeah, there's 60,000 abortions on average every year. Um, but it's, it's a topic that we cannot talk about. We, we don't even, like, like Steven said, we don't even go near that because we know the waves are just going to come plumbing down. And we saw it in, in December, you know, the ultra conservative right reacting to, you know, a country in Latin America um, legalizing abortion. It was just like, what's, what's happening here? We need to react to this. Um, so in, in that sense, for that specific issue, we try to stay under the radar. The fact that we're not in Guatemala City, but we're, you know, in a, in a small town in Antigua uh, kind of helps us navigate that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we see it from the conservatives uh, in the city, you know, the, the, those that are in power, you know, in government and, and the elites uh, just going fully against it. So, you know, not even, not even able to talk about it. Um, but there was definitely a reaction after Argentina. Those of us who, who are progressives that are educated, like Stephen said, applaud it, applaud it immensely. Uh, but our voices, you know, are, are not too many, unfortunately. Stephen? Uh-huh. You yeah, want me to? Oh, you um, don't have to if you don't want to. No, my, my experience, our experience, what Rodrigo said, if, you're, if you are working out of the sort of mainstream, you have a lot more, uh, um, you, may, you may experience, uh, or you will not, you just cannot deal too directly with abortion. Now, I know that in Caracas, which is the capital city of Venezuela, and it's still a big cosmopolitan city, there is a lot of pro-abortion or pro-choice uh, activity, and there are feminist groups, and they're very active. And I, because I'm really a step removed from that. I, I can't, I don't really know what's going on, but uh, I'm working with several young European women doctors who are trying to set up phone apps around mobilizing that. Um, so something's going on and, and I think it's just going to continue to be a contentious issue. Mm -hmm. However, you know, that is just, there's no way around that. Um, but you, you may have seen, H H Hannah, I sent you a, a photograph of a, of a, a sex, as you, what we call a, re, a responsible sexuality workshop going on in a church mm -hmm. with the crucifixion behind yeah, and everything. And these priests invited us into their church to give responsible sexuality workshops to adolescents. So yeah, exactly, I didn't know exactly. That. I don't think, I think they're, they're cracks in the wall, they're niches and we just have to, maybe we start with family planning because we can't get to abortion. We start with family planning. But I think that anybody who lives in a remote or poor rural area understands the plight of the women, 
are, are not going to be able to, and that's uh, deny women their basic rights, you know, mm -hmm. these very basic human rights. Right, yeah, I mean, Argentina was just a, a really, really cool example of, of um, you know, people and society at large sort of overcoming the, the large pervasive um, and historically very relevant uh, religious influence. Um, so I was just kind of curious on the ground what that meant in terms of advocacy, but. Um, but, but Hannah, don't forget also a government that was open to the topic, to the issue, that was mm -hmm. sensitive enough to, to really take the lead on it. Um, yeah. And that's what we're lacking in most of our in the countries in our region. Right. Right. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm really, I, I can't believe how fast that went. Um, we're already way over time. So um, if anybody has any outstanding questions, they can feel free to, to voice them in the chat and we'll try to get to them afterwards. Um, but I want to let, uh, be aware of time here since we are so far over. So Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thanks to Rodrigo, Stephen, Dr. Gladys, and Janet. That was a really interesting discussion and it was uh, amazing to learn about all of the very, very important work you're doing uh, throughout the world. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Happy weekend, everyone. Happy Friday. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And stay safe thank and you. healthy, get your vaccinations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay, am I staying on? Are we staying on or what's going on? Yeah. Um, if participants have any speakers, if you have to go, feel free to hop off. Um, we'll be on to answer any questions from participants if they have any. For any participants who are still on, you can feel free to either come off mute or drop any questions that you have in the chat if you have any. Um, I have a question. This is this is Dawn. So what do we do next? Is this the series lead us to the meeting with our senators and Congress people? Is that the end result or the hope that? That's a great question. Um, do you mean, sorry, I you cut out a little bit. Do you mean what do we what are we doing next as far as in Capitol Hill days or what are we doing with this information we just learned in the panel? Yes, so what do we, like, how can I make a difference? Like, what do I do with this information that I've learned? Is it, sounds like the setup you guys have is that we listen to all this information and then we're gonna be trained how to speak to our senators and our congressmen to get them to get support from our government for these countries and situations. Is that the? Yeah. So I think that's definitely our approach. You know, I think as like Hannah and the other panelists really underscored the, you know, main way that we address all of these really intersectional issues is by expanding access to comprehensive reproductive health care for people around the world. So um, in our next, in our session on Saturday, you're going to learn a little more about how U.S. policies impact the LGBTQ plus community. On Sunday, we're gonna go through a really comprehensive training on how um, we talk with our senators and representatives to make the asks that will ultimately help expand that access to reproductive health care um, worldwide. 
Okay, great. And do you guys have information like on how we can do this in our own communities, like where, where we could start at home as well? Yeah, definitely. There's so many ways that you can get involved. I think the best way is by just reaching out to one of us. I'll drop my email in the chat here, but I also have your email. So I'll okay. reach out separately um, and we can find a time to chat just about what you're interested in. But you can okay. also visit I will fight for her dot. I can't like say this and type it at the same time. I will fight for her dot org um, for more information on how you can take action to um, eliminate the policies that we'll be talking about a lot on Sunday. So okay. eliminating the global gag rule and then increasing um, the budget for international family planning um, services. OK, great. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you guys bringing this forward and thank you so much i mean you're so beautiful to see you young women just jumping on this and supporting this so thank you so much thank you so much all right we'll, be, we'll be see well you see you tomorrow okay see you tomorrow <laughs> thank you does anyone else have any questions Sybil, do you have a question? No worries if you don't. <laughs> yeah, you can come off mute. He also dropped the question in the chat, Lindsay. If you'd like me to oh. read you or. Um, yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I. <laughs> I think a lot of us, yeah, are inspired and also that we know a lot of this information. I'm ready for action. And I know that I will be uh, contacting my um, senators in Oregon and also uh, writing letters to our local newspaper. Um, are there other actions I can take? That's a great question. Um, there are a lot of different ways to get involved. What you just said are all great ways. Um, I'll include that link to the same website. Um, so www.iwillfightforher.org. Um, okay. Yeah, we, I've got that. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> um, and that'll include a lot of different ways um, that you can take action um, and support our work. Um, okay. But I think especially, you know, we're going to be meeting with senators and representatives on Monday um, to really advocate for these policy priorities. Um, okay. Are you are you planning on joining for the meetings? Yes. Okay. Um, as much as I can. Now, are you part of Population Connection? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. And so then, um, do you have like a form letter that? Uh, it is helpful for you know sending to um, representatives and newspapers. We actually so on Monday we'll have we'll be sending it out to all participants, but we'll have a really easy way where you can just like press one button and contact your senators and representatives. That includes a sample letter with the okay. language. Um, Good. So we can send that to you. Um, and as far as contacting newspapers and stuff like that, um, I can reach out to you separately, but we have like a template letter to the editor that you can submit to your local paper and um, things like that, which are great right. ways to take action. Yes, and then I can also add on to the letter if it's not already added your website and uh, link to. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I think that's really important when, uh, people uh, yeah, send letters to so that people who read the letter and wish to react that they know how to respond. Yeah. yeah. I'd like that on the news shows, you know, the news shows will have different uh, little excerpts about different situations. And at the bottom, I wish that they would put um, links and websites of who to, uh, who to support and who to <laughs> <laughs> to uh, uh, yeah, make a, um, yeah, yeah, let them know that what they're doing is uh, is questionable. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely um, going to follow through on all of this, and uh, yeah, um, because uh, I, I'm a big wildlife conservationist, and uh, yeah, 
overpopulation to from what I know, and I attended lectures years ago at UC Berkeley with Paul Ehrlich, you know, he was the one who really started uh, to get this information out. And uh, just about all the problems on this planet are from overpopulation. It, it goes down to overpopulation. And uh, yeah, it's, it's important for all of our uh, leaders in all the countries to respond to this uh, very, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's right in our faces. And yet so many people are afraid to respond either because of religious uh, backgrounds. Yeah, but, but I don't see it as a racist or religious issue. It's called survival. <laughs> that's, that's what the issue is. Yeah, survival for all living um, species on this planet. So thank you very much, Lindsay, and we'll stay in touch. Bye. Thanks so much for joining. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye. Are there any other questions from folks still on the call? Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope we see you at tomorrow's session at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thanks.